Hey there, and welcome to DIY Projects with Pete. In today's episode, we'll be building concrete countertops. We'll go through the processes of building the molds, pouring the concrete, finishing it, and installing them. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And let's go ahead and get started with today's project. I started by removing the old laminate counters. These were attached with screws from the underside, so I simply removed the screws and pulled them out. I found a big dual basin undermount sink at the store and unboxed it so I could find the sink template. Now this sink had a nice cardboard template which will help with making the sink knockout for the mold we'll be building in a later step. I measured the cabinet area to determine the layout for the concrete counters. I'll keep the slabs manageable by creating one seam in the concrete to the right of the sink. Today's project will be a total of three pieces, the long slab with the sink knockout, the L-shaped corner, and the small slab to the right of the stove. You can measure the areas to determine placement and sizing, or you can build a template. Now building a template is definitely helpful to make sure you get the measurements correct, especially for really complex counters or if the walls aren't exactly square. It's not 100% necessary, but it can help make it easier to get the perfect layout since we'll be using the reverse cast technique in building these counters. So we'll actually have to build the molds mirrored to how they'll be when they're flipped right side up. I cut a few strips of quarter inch thick plywood to about one and a half inches in width to help with building the templates. Then I pieced the wood together to get them the exact size that I want the actual counters. I went with a three quarter inch overhang over the actual cabinet doors. Typically this would be about one and a half inches from the cabinet's face frame since the doors are another three quarter inches thick, you know, typically. I usually use a hot glue gun to quickly make the templates, but I ran out of glue sticks so I used a fast setting super glue that was laying around the house. I labeled the template so I knew the front, back, left, and right sides, as well as the seam side and where the sink would be. The next big step is to build the molds that are going to hold the concrete. I transferred the measurements to a sheet of melamine. Now melamine is basically a particle board with a smooth white and waterproof coating on each side. It's going to help you get a smooth finish since the concrete will form against it. You can use the template to double check everything and to make sure the layout is correct. Just remember to flip the template upside down if you're using the reverse cast technique like I'm doing in this video. I used a circular saw to make quite a few of the cuts. A table saw is another option if you have one, and I finished off a few of the cuts with a jigsaw. Here's a look at the piece that will be the base of the mold for the smallest slab. The next step is to build the side walls of the mold. It's best to use a table saw for this portion of the project. We'll cut the strips to two and three quarters inches in width to form our two inch thick countertops. That extra three quarters of an inch accommodates for the three quarters of an inch thickness of the base of the mold since it's going to be attached from the side. Find a flat surface to assemble your molds on. Cut the sidewalls down in length on a miter saw. Then pre-drill and secure the sidewalls in place with one and five eighths inch long drywall screws. I typically space the screws about every six to eight inches or so. Pre-drill through the sidewall and into the base piece and make sure to hold the drill as level as possible to help ensure the screw goes into the center of the base piece. I cut 45 degree angles where there were inside corners. This way, I didn't have any particle board facing inside the mold. Double check the sink is in the proper location and trace around the mold if you haven't already. I had four inches of room toward the wall behind the sink and three inches in front of the sink. This is about as narrow as I'd recommend having the pieces between the front and back of the sink. The next step is to build the sink knockout. I used two inch thick foam for this process. You'll want to trace around the template onto the foam and then cut it out. I find that cutting all four sides with the table saw seems to do a good job. A scroll saw or a band saw would work well too, especially with sinks with more curves to them. The corners for my sink only needed a slight round over. A belt sander or a round over bit on a router will do this process. There are a number of ways to create sink knockout molds, so feel free to use your method of choice. Now once this is cut, you can lightly sand out any rough areas. I used a drywall sander with a screen. Next, you'll want to seam the sides of the foam. Stucco tape works well for this process. Other smooth tapes will work as well. Go around the foam and make sure the tape goes on evenly without any creases. The concrete is going to form against the tape, so any unevenness or creases will show in the final result. The tape might not go over the foam completely, but a silicone bead will cover it since the bead will be run around this portion to give the sink area a slight bevel.
Once this was complete, I started working on the reinforcement for the concrete. For today's project, I'm using wire mesh that you can buy in 4x8 sheets at the hardware store in the concrete section. I started by cutting the mesh down to size with a bolt cutter so that it fits in the mold and has about an inch of room between the reinforcement and perimeter of the mold. Next, I removed reinforcement from the sink area. And to help strengthen the concrete around the sink area, I added some 3 8 inch rebar around each side of the sink. You can cut it to length with a cutoff blade on an angle grinder. Once it's cut, I attach the rebar to the existing wire mesh using zip ties. Now you'd usually use metal wire, but I've never had any issues with the zip ties and they make it super easy to attach it. Make sure to cut the zip tie tails and then continue adding reinforcement to the rest of the molds. I typically only use rebar if my counters are at least two inches thick. And another option for reinforcement is hog wire mesh. It's about one quarter inch diameter and it works really well. It's a bit harder to find, but is generally available at most farm supply stores. I used a speed square to make sure all the side walls and corners are square. If anything is slightly out of square, you can slightly push or pull the side wall to adjust it, then pre-drill and add a screw. Go ahead and give the molds a good cleaning with a shop vac and some rubbing alcohol if needed. Then attach the foam knockout to the mold with some silicone. Next, we'll seal each mold with silicone. There's a number of ways to do this, but we're going to use the taping method in today's example because it's pretty foolproof and it makes it so you don't get silicone all over if you don't have much experience applying it. You'll want to have a razor blade, scissors, and some painter's tape handy for this part. Leave about 3 16 of an inch gap between the tape and the seam. Go around the base of the mold and then do the same thing on the sidewalls. At each corner, you'll want to run the tape vertically so that it can be sealed with silicone as well. One thing I made a mistake on was I accidentally added silicone along the side where the seam would be for where the large piece butts up to the L-shaped corner concrete piece. Now you don't want to add silicone where the seam is because if you do, the seam edges are beveled and so your seam is going to appear much larger. So learn from my mistake, mark the seam sides and don't add silicone where any seams will be. Next we'll make the knockouts for the faucet and soap dispenser. You may need to reference your sink to see if you need to line up holes with any holes already pre-drilled in the sink. I made the knockouts using foam pipe insulation and I cut it with a razor blade. Now you may need two different sizes of insulation if your counter is too thick for the faucet stem length, so you have enough thread to secure the faucet from the bottom with the nut. You can buy pre-made rubber faucet knockouts from Amazon if you'd prefer, and a lot of people make them out of PVC pipe and put a slot in it so it can contract a bit easier when pulling it out. If you use that method, I'd recommend going around the pipe a couple times with duct tape to help it come out easier. I use the pipe insulation because it's easy to cut and it pulls out super easily. Do a quick cleaning to remove any debris before you apply the silicone. Apply a bead of 100% silicone around the perimeter of each mold. Have a cup of water and paper towels handy for the step. Next, dip your index finger in the water and run it over the silicone to bevel it. Pull up at each corner and use a paper towel to remove the silicone from your finger. Then dip your finger in the water again and do another side. This process goes pretty quickly and if you accidentally get any silicone on the mold, just wipe it off. Go around the sink as well. I'd recommend taping it off, or if you're comfortable using a round over tool, then go for it. Once all the silicone is applied, you can go ahead and remove the tape. I've found that I get the best result if I remove the tape while the silicone's still wet. Make sure to have a garbage can nearby for all the excess tape. I used some silicone to attach the sink knockouts to the mold and put some tape over the knockouts to prevent concrete from getting in them. Do a final cleaning of the mold before the concrete is poured. Use a razor blade to remove any dried silicone and some rubbing alcohol and a rag to get rid of anything else. You'll wanna let the silicone in the mold cure for a couple hours or until it's firm before mixing and pouring any concrete. Now comes the fun part. You'll wanna put on some old jeans and a work shirt because working with concrete is a pretty messy job. Now I usually mix the concrete in a tub by hand, but a buddy offered to let me borrow an electric mixer so I gave it a shot. For today's project, I'm using the Quick Creek Countertop Mix. It's specifically formulated for counters and has some additives to give you a more flowable mix with less water. It has a few other additives as well. Now, concrete's main ingredients are the aggregate, which are the rocks and sand, cement, which binds them together like glue, and then water to bring it all together. All mixes are different, and there's definitely advantages and disadvantages for each type of mix. 
This mix is $23 per bag, and the regular QuickCrete 5000 is only about six bucks a bag. So I'll go through a few differences to help you decide which is the best for you. You'll want to read the manufacturer's instructions to determine how much water to add to the mix. You can also add coloring to the mix, and I use some charcoal coloring to give them a little darker color. The one thing about color is you have to be somewhat precise for everything to match up perfectly, which isn't too hard, but I really do like the natural gray color concrete as well, and not adding color is one less thing to worry about, so that's something to think about. You want to shoot for somewhat of a flowable mixture with this mix. You don't want it too soupy, but you also don't want it too dry. You can always add a little more concrete mix if it is too soupy while mixing or vice versa. You can add more water if it's too dry. I typically try to mix about two full bags at a time. Transfer the mix to a bucket and then begin filling up the mold. You'll want to push the concrete into the corners and throughout the mold. Use your hands to press the concrete around and kind of jab your fingers to sort of vibrate the concrete a bit. You'll want to fill each mold a little over half full before any reinforcement is added. One thing I have noticed about this mix is that it starts to set up a little faster than the normal QuickCrete 5000. This isn't a big deal for smaller projects and slabs, but when you get to larger slabs like this one, you'll need to hustle a little bit more and it really helps to have someone helping you. Take your time to get the concrete pushed in and around the knockouts, corners, and sides. Fill it a little over halfway, and after it's filled halfway, you'll want to spend a decent amount of time vibrating the concrete to get all the air bubbles out. The more time you spend, the fewer voids you'll have in the finished piece. I've found that lifting the table up and down quickly does a great job getting a lot of the air bubbles out. You can also tap the sides with a rubber mallet or use an orbital sander or reciprocating saw without a blade to run around the outside sidewalls to help remove voids from the sides. Next, we'll put the reinforcement in place. The rebar near the faucet knockouts will go behind them, and you may need to bend the mesh a bit to help it lay as flat as possible in the concrete. It can be a bit tricky, so take your time to get it to sit in the concrete well. I'd recommend doing the majority of the concrete vibrating where you're actually shaking the table up and down before adding the reinforcement. This is going to prevent any shadowing or ghosting that could occur. Once that's in, you can go ahead and fill the mold completely with concrete. Make it a point to really try and blend the two pores so the entire slab looks consistent. You can poke your fingers to blend them together a bit if needed, and to help add additional strength around the sink area specifically, I mixed glass fibers into the concrete mix. I packed this mix around the sink area, and you only want to mix the glass fibers into the portion of the counter that will be facing down. If the glass fibers get into the top side, you'll be able to see them. You can find the fibers on Amazon or at most local concrete supply stores. Once the mold is full, use a scrap board to screed the concrete. Move it back and forth in a saw-like motion to level it and to remove excess concrete. The extra concrete can either be put into low spots or back into the bucket. The high density foam I bought was unfortunately slightly more than two inches thick, so I had to do my best to level the concrete around it. After screeding the concrete, I ran a trowel over the slab to work it a bit and to start to give what will be the underside a flat and fairly smooth surface. I'd say the special countertop mix might be a little easier to work with for a beginner, and it has a much creamier feel to it while troweling. It has much smaller aggregate, which is mostly the size of sand, and the cheaper mix has a larger aggregate about the size of pea gravel. Then I mixed up the rest of the concrete so all the molds could be topped off. Make sure your tables are fairly level at this point so the concrete doesn't flow to one side during the curing process, and then vibrate the sides with a rubber mallet or another concrete vibrating tool. The more time you take for this, the better results you'll have. As the concrete starts to firm up over the next hour or so, I like to go over the slabs with a trowel yet again just to give it a little smoother finish. Not everyone will do this, but I like to take the extra time to trowel it. Next you can put some plastic over the concrete to help it cure evenly. Now it's time to let the concrete cure and do its thing over the next 48 hours or so. I had some elk visit for cocktail hour, so I got a little footage of them. But kick your feet up and take a break after all your hard work. Job well done. Once the concrete has had time to cure, we'll remove the sidewalls from the concrete. Use a drill and remove the screws, then slowly pull away each sidewall. You can use a screwdriver to help pry the sidewalls away, but make sure the screwdriver or chisel only pushes against the wood. If you push it against the concrete, you can easily chip and damage it at this point since it's still continuing to cure. 
Here's an up close look at the sides fresh out of the mold. They still have some moisture which is going to continue to dry out but what you're hoping for is to have smooth sides without too many voids. I was pretty happy with how they're looking so far and I like to hydrate the slabs with water as they continue to cure because it helps with the process. Next, I removed the faucet and sink knockouts. I cut down the center of the sink knockout with a knife and then slowly pulled out the foam. Use some sandpaper to lightly sand the edges of the concrete. Make sure to sand from the corner out and not into the corner because you can risk blowing out a corner. Sanding the edges will clean them up and help prevent any chipping while flipping the concrete. I flipped the smallest slab first. You can see there are very few voids and that the concrete is nice and smooth. Go ahead and hydrate the slabs once they're out of the mold. Next, I started to prepare for the sink portion of the mold. You need to be extra careful with this one since it has the big knockout and narrow portions around the front and back of the sink. If you feel it needs a little more time to cure before flipping, go ahead and wait a day or two longer just to play it safe. When ready to flip, put a few rags down for the concrete to rest on while flipping it. I flipped with the back side against the table. That way, if it chips for any reason, it won't matter since we'll be against the wall. Once the concrete is vertical, move around to the other side and slowly lower the concrete onto the foam. Make sure the concrete is evenly supported while lowering it and that the foam will evenly distribute the weight of the concrete while it continues to cure. You'll see there are very few voids, so I was pretty happy with it. I'd recommend letting it cure out of the mold for at least another day or two before polishing or sanding. This way it will continue to harden to a higher PSI, which will lead to better results while sanding or polishing. I grabbed a tarp to protect the work surface and then wheeled my table outside. For this project, I'll be wet polishing the concrete. Wet polishing will give you a very smooth and professional finish. However, dry sanding with a normal orbital sander is also an option and I've had great results that way too. If you're interested in seeing that process, please check out my Outdoor Kitchen Concrete Tops video, which is linked to in the description below. Polishing concrete is pretty messy, so I like to cut a few holes in a garbage bag and wear it to stay dry. Rubber boots are also a good thing to wear. Now wet polishers can sometimes be rented at a local tool rental business, but if you can't find one, there are rental sites online that will ship one to you. Or you can purchase your own, which is in the neighborhood of $200 on Amazon. I start by doing a quick polish of the underside, especially around the perimeter overhang area where someone might run their fingers. I'll use a 200 or a 400 grit polishing pad and then call it good. I'll also slightly bevel the edge. I'll polish each slab and then use a squeegee to remove excess water. Once that's dry, I'm applying sealer to just the underside of the counter. This way I can minimize how many times I have to flip the slabs. Flip the slabs right side up and start polishing them. I started out with an 800 grit pad. 400 grit and below will more so grind the concrete to expose the aggregate, which can be really cool if you want to see the rocks and sand in the concrete. It's also what you'd use if you embed items like crushed glass into the concrete. Anything above 400 grit is more of a polishing pad and it won't expose the aggregate. I wanted to keep the natural gray look and so I lightly polished each slab with the 800. Polishing will expose new voids which will fill in later with a mixture of Portland cement and acrylic fortifier or water that I'll refer to as a slurry mix. I also like to use the 800 grit pad to lightly round over the top edges and corners. The next step is to fill the voids with a slurry mixture. I typically use Portland cement and I mix it with an acrylic fortifier which will help it bond a little better than just water. I'll mix in a little color if I'm trying to match the color of the concrete slab and I'll use my hands to rub the slurry mixture into the holes and have a plastic putty knife as well. The putty knife works great for removing excess and then do your best to fill in as many voids as you can. Take your time to remove a lot of the excess so you don't have to polish through a bunch of it later. Once complete, let the slurry mixture dry for at least a few hours, then go ahead and do the final polishing. I used a 1500 grit pad to remove the slurry and to give the concrete a nice sheen. Make sure all the excess slurry has been polished away. To polish the sink area, I'll use a normal polishing pad where I can, and then I'll get the corners and hard to reach areas with either a hand polishing pad or a blue scotch pad. I've actually found that the blue scotch pad works really well. After polishing, I'll remove the water with a squeegee to see if there's any spots I may have missed with the polisher. 
The next step was to seal the counters. I wiped each slab down with a clean rag and then applied a food safe water based acrylic sealer. Apply the sealer according to the manufacturer's instructions. This one took a few coats. I've been using Chang's and Tough Duck water based concrete sealers for years and they work pretty well in combination with wax. Concrete counters can still stain through these sealers though and I haven't yet found the perfect sealer. However, I recently heard a lot of good things about the Omega sealer from the Concrete Countertop Institute, so I'm really looking forward to testing that out in future projects. I wanted to beef up the cabinets a bit for these heavy concrete counters. I simply strengthened them by adding a few 3 quarter inch thick pieces of plywood in each box. This also gives the concrete more surface area so the weight is evenly distributed. I used pocket holes and screws to secure the extra boards in place. I prepared to mount the sink by framing in the cabinet with additional boards around the perimeter for the lip of the sink to rest on. The plywood strips are set about 1 8 of an inch lower than the cabinet so the metal lip of the sink will rest flush with the top of the cabinets. I prefer this method over using clips because I don't really like to drill into the concrete. Next we started moving in the concrete. I recruited my buddy Rick to help install the tops. He was in town to do some fly fishing, so of course I had to put him to work after he got back from the river. I applied 100% silicone to the tops of the cabinets to secure the concrete in place and prevent it from shifting. Here's a look at the area we've prepared for the sink. I applied clear silicone to hold the sink in place. The sink fit in like a glove and is nice and secure. I made a few small adjustments to make sure it would be centered for the concrete, and then I double checked that everything was level. The sink I purchased only had a hole for the faucet, so I had to add an extra hole for the soap dispenser. A step bit is what I'd normally use and would recommend using, but I didn't have one, so I grabbed the plasma cutter and made a quick cut. Silicone was added to the cabinet tops, and then the final slab was put in place. Make sure the concrete countertop is level and that it's lined up with the sink. I picked up a pull-down faucet from Kohler and a soap dispenser. They were really easy to install. I mentioned that I made a little mistake and beveled the top edges of the counters where the seam is, and so it's definitely more noticeable, but honestly it doesn't bother me one bit. I pushed the slabs together as close as possible, taped each side of the seam, mixed up some silicone with gray pigment, and then used a putty knife to apply a smooth line. Next, I used clear silicone to seal the space between the counter and the sink. I taped on each side of the seam, ran a bead, and then smoothed it over with my index finger. Lastly, I pulled off the tape, waxed the counters, and called it good. All right, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and that it helps and inspires you with whatever concrete project you're working on. If you found the video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And if you're interested in more concrete projects, I have a ton of different ones in my concrete projects playlist, which you can find in the description below. Thanks again for watching and cheers from Montana.